Good morning. Welcome to worship this morning. It's good to see all of you here. Uh, today we'll be continuing our series, What Does Jesus Ask of You? And in our scripture later on, you'll hear that Jesus tells the disciples, give to God what is God's. And so as we begin worship this morning, let us do so with joy and thanksgiving because our praise belongs to God. That's why we're here, to give him what is due to our Lord and Savior. Psalm 100 says, Shout for joy to the Lord all the earth. Worship the Lord with gladness. Come before his presence with joyful songs. Know that the Lord is God. It is he who made us and we are his, his people and the sheep of his pasture. So we enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. We give thanks to him and we praise his name. So let us worship God together. Please stand and lift up your joyful hearts to the Lord today. continue in worship today, we're going to take a moment to come before the Lord together in prayer as we confess our sins to him and our, our burdens that we are carrying. 
So I encourage you, if you feel comfortable, just take this posture of an open palm uh, as a way of reminding your body that we are offering uh, ourselves to the Lord. So let's pray together. Lord, we, we come before you this morning and carrying many different things. But Lord, we take this moment to lay everything that is on our minds, that's on our hearts, to lay it all down at your feet. Lord, we confess the ways that we fall short of, of who you are and who you call us to be. Lord, there are so many things in this world that try to take our attention. So many idols that we give our lives to, like money or power or greed, that are in place of following you. So God, we confess and we, we ask for your grace today in the ways that we fall short. We ask for your mercy. Lord, in this time, we, we take this time to lift up our own personal confessions to you. Hear these words in Matthew 11, 28. Jesus says, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So friends, that is what we believe about Jesus as we come to worship today. He is inviting us to come and to lay our burdens, to take his yoke upon us, because his yoke is easy and his burden is light. So friends, believe the good news. In Jesus Christ, we are forgiven. Let's continue singing together. Yo 
Lord, we thank you that we can come just as we are today in your house of worship. Lord, we ask that you continue to speak to us throughout this service today and teach us what we need to learn, speak to us what we need to hear so that we can continue to follow your voice. And it's in Jesus' name that we pray and all God's people said, Amen. Amen. Well, you can take a moment now to extend the peace of Christ to someone around you, greet someone around you, and then you can have a seat. Well, as we continue in worship this morning, we have a number of announcements. First of all, if you're a visitor to the church, we're glad you're here. Uh, we've got these Connect cards, an opportunity for you to find out more about ministries here at the church. You can find them in the pews and just fill it out and leave it in an offering plate or with an usher after the service, or even um, go to the Welcome Center and talk with someone and learn more about the church. We just would hope that you'd consider this to be your future church family, so welcome. Uh, this summer, or this week, uh, promises to be a summer of fun. There are so many great things happening this week, starting with our youth ministry, uh, an end of summer celebration for all of our youth, junior high and senior high together, starting at 6 o'clock tonight. Uh, there will be food, burgers on the grill, as well as huge inflatables and other games uh, and live and music, I believe. And so it promises to be a really fun night. So we want everyone, all of our youth, to come out for that event. We've got a great turnout coming already, so don't miss it. Also, um, the next uh, Tuesday, uh, the 23rd, our We Group is also having a fellowship time uh, out in the Village Green. Uh, this is for our Widows Evolving, uh, our women's group. Uh, they're going to be going to the Village Green for a, one of the public concerts. This time it's ABBA, uh, music of ABBA, so it's not to be missed. So please join others in fellowship with We on, at 6 o'clock on Tuesday. Then on Thursday, uh, we have a small group leader's uh, workshop. And this is really a workshop for anybody who is a small group leader or anybody really interested in small group ministry who has a passion for that to learn more about how we can make our small groups better and how small groups relate to the mission of the church as well as discipleship in the church, which is going to be a focus this fall uh, with our adult ed class. So we want you to come and learn more about that. Seven o'clock in the fireside room. It's led by me and Sue Blue, and we really hope as many of you can come who are interested. Uh, our last event is a church picnic a week from today. Following this service, our deacons are sponsoring a, a picnic for people of all ages. We'll have games, live music from Bach to Rock, as well as a lot of food. So please come to that. And uh, I guess there's an invitation for anybody who wants to bring cookies to the picnic. Feel free, not obligated, but that's a way of sharing dessert with each other at that event. So you can learn more about all these ministries in the church e-blast or in the news. And so please check that out. We're also on Realm. And all of these ministries are supported by the giving of this church. And so we thank you for your support. Um, all these ministries and the missions of our church couldn't continue without the support of generous giving. So don't forget to give online or in the offering plates as you leave the church or even sticking a check in the mail. Uh, we thank you for your past support, your current stewardship, and your future giving. Uh, as we continue in worship now, we'll hear God's word as Lois reads for us. Good morning, everyone. Our scripture reading for today is from the book of Matthew, chapter 22, verses 15 to 22. But first, let us pray. Bow your heads, please. Lord, by the power of your Holy Spirit, prepare our hearts and minds to hear and accept your word for us today. 
silence in us any voices but your own, so that we may hear your word and also live it out in our daily lives through Christ our Lord. Amen. Then the Pharisees went out and laid plans to trap him in his words. They sent their disciples to him along with the Herodians. Teacher, they said, we know that you are a man of integrity and that you teach the way of God in accordance with the truth. You aren't swayed by others because you pay no attention to who they are. Tell us then, what is your opinion? Is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? But Jesus, knowing their evil intent, said, You hypocrites, why are you trying to trap me? Show me the coin used for paying the tax. They brought him a denarius, and he asked them, Whose image is this, and whose inscription? Caesar's, they replied. Then he said to them, So give back to Caesar what is Caesar's, and to God what is God's. When they heard this, they were amazed, so they left him and went away. This is the word of God. Thanks. Well, it is, it is good to be back here after being gone for a couple of weeks, uh, spending some time away on, on vacation. Our family went to uh, Yellowstone and the Tetons uh, for a week or a little bit over a week or so. We had a great time out there. Uh, how many of you all have been to Yellowstone and the Tetons? Okay, for the, God, God, that's so great. Uh, and if you haven't been there, we're going to get you there somehow. I don't know how, but we're going to make it happen. It is just, oh, it's so wonderful. Uh, for me, for our family, in many ways, it's like going home, not because we've lived in a national park ever, unless you think of Colorado as a national park, and some people think of Colorado as a national park, but, but we've never lived in a national park, but it's probably some of our best memories as a family, uh, and so it feels like going home when we go out there, and so we had a great time uh, enjoying the wilderness, uh, enjoying some uh, pseudo camping, we called it. Uh, as well as trying to navigate the fear of grizzly bears in huckleberry patches and uh, those type of things and hiking 15 miles and my children having a great idea we should run the final miles or so on the hike. Thank you so much, Kelsey. We really appreciate that. Uh, my feet are still sore from that. Uh, but it was just great. It was absolutely wonderful. Uh, someday we'll uh, get you out there. And we have a crew going to... Uh, Zion and Bryce Canyon that Missy and I are leading, Return to the Garden Ministries, we call it, uh, and so helping people uh, real, see using God's creation as a way to form Christian community and, and, and see some of that. So that's going off here in about a month and a half. But let us turn now to uh, the scripture for today that Lois read so well. Uh, it's a great text, and God has something he wants to do with it to us. So let's open ourselves up to him. Uh, let us pray. Come, Holy Spirit, with all your power and might and fall afresh on us so that we might hear your word for us today. Give us the courage to act upon it, to be open to the shaping power of it through your spirit, and help us, O oh God, to just recognize that you are going to use this to shape us, mold us more into the Son's likeness. Um, we will... Uh, we are looking forward to that, God, and yet at the same time, we are nervous about what you're going to do with this. But to help us, Lord, to listen with eager intent. Uh, it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Now, if, if you did not live in the Northbrook or Glenview area, you might not have heard of it or heard it, but there were some loud booms kind of to the south of us on Friday night. Uh, it happened about 9, 9.15. Uh, in our house, we heard it here in Northbrook, and, and we were like wondering, what is that all about? What's going on? Uh, but sure enough, Glenview had their fireworks display uh, on Friday night down there, and so we even got into our car, tried to go down Shermer to get there, and we saw the final boom, and that was it. Uh, we didn't get there in time. Uh, but so we ended up uh, coming to downtown Northbrook and just kind of going on a nice uh, stroll uh, around the Village Green, which was wonderful. But I love fireworks, and I don't know about you. And certainly now in the world in which we live, and, and sadly because of what took place in Highland Park, uh, you know, you, it reminds us of the 4th of July in many ways. And, uh, and so we continue to certainly lift up those communities 
uh, north of us and people that are affected by what took place up there over the 4th of July. But when I hear fireworks, I think of all sorts of things. Uh, I think of some images in my own life. Perhaps you do too when you hear fireworks. Uh, but I think of the 4th of July. I think of uh, sitting there at, in St. Paul, Minnesota during high school, uh, listening to the uh, Philharmonic Symphony playing the 1812 Overture, and they had cannons, and they were firing the cannons in the big cannon scene of the 1812 Overture, where boom, 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 and fireworks going off there, and it was on July 4th, and yes, it snowed that July 4th. There were some snowflakes coming down. Didn't stick, but there was snow. And I also think of the time when I was a little kid and my dad all of a sudden appeared at the balcony of our neighborhood 4th of July parade and he was dressed as Uncle Sam uh, and he actually had to put on that fake beard. I mean, they didn't wear beards back then, uh, but he had that fake beard and he gave this incredible, supposedly patriotic speech uh, and I had that mixed feeling of total embarrassment, but this is kind of cool too, but I don't want to show that. Uh, but seeing my dad up there dressed in a full outfit and all that, uh, when I think of the 4th of July and fireworks, I remember going to the mall there in Washington, D.C. and listening to the music and seeing the fireworks over the mall. It was just this beautiful, incredible sight uh, and all. It's definitely a bucket list thing. I encourage anyone to do that. And so fireworks for me think, makes me think of just patriotism, thinking of all the different things, uh, uh, the way in which we um, are engaged with the world today. And as we continue in this series of taking a look at these questions that Jesus certainly is asking, as well as questions that are being asked of Jesus, uh, we're looking at a key fundamental question um, that Jesus has asked, as well as he asked the people uh, as well. And it, it's a key question because it gives an answer, he gives an answer to a very, very basic question that is asked of all followers of Jesus Christ. And that is simply this, as a Christian, how much of myself do I give to the country in which I live, the nation in which I reside? If saying that Jesus is Lord of my life, at some point, if it hasn't happened already, you're going to be forced and you're going to find that you're going to need to ask yourself that question, to what degree as a Christian do I need to be engaged or involved in the way in which society is ordered and structured, government. Because how that is done, it, it reflects in many ways what we most hold dearly about what we believe. Now, it'd be easy to think that this question is limited to those of us who live in the United States, uh, but it is not uniquely an American question at all. It is a universal question asked by Christians all over the globe. From those who certainly live in Brazil, those Christians who happen to live in China or even in the Philippines or Christians in Australia, South Africa, Egypt, Kenya, Somalia, Somalia, even in the Ukraine and Russia, this question, to what degree as a Christian should I be fully engaged in the way in which society is ordered and structured or to what degree does my country have my loyalty? That is a fundamental question that all Christians, no matter where they live, where you find yourself, that at some point you need to ask yourself, and you will find yourself asking for yourself, because if Jesus is Lord, that means someone else is not Lord of your life. So, it is a universal question, and then this text in the Gospel of Matthew 22, there are a way in which Jesus gets after this question and all, and there is nothing more personal, I think, in some ways than the issue of taxes. Um, because taxes, how we are taxed, tells us something about what we value in life, of what is value in our life. And this account begins with the Pharisees coming to Jesus to entrap him, or as, as one translation puts it, ensnare him. I just kind of imagine Jesus there, uh, you know, someone has laid a trap uh, uh, and all, and he's about to step in, and it's going to yank his foot and, and, and trap him there. But the Pharisees are out to get Jesus, and it's certainly no surprise 
that they viewed Jesus as someone who quite literally was turning their world and the surrounding world upside down. Matthew brings up the turning of the money changer tables there in the temple just in the prior chapter in Matthew 21. And so Jesus is challenging uh, folks in what it means uh, to ha- have uh, what it means to uh, be engaged in the world, what it means to uh, have loyalty in the world. But the Pharisees were sending their disciples to entrap Jesus. But they also sent the Herodians too, those people who followed and implemented the way of Herod, the overarching kind of power of the day, the rulers of the day. It was the many ways, the ultimate cover your bases approach to make sure that you are putting Jesus in between the horns of a dilemma. They had the religious side covered with those uh, disciples of the Pharisees. And they had the political side covered as well with the Herodians. And the trap was being laid out. And all that Jesus had to do was to answer any side of their question that they're about to ask. And so after they buttered him up with those accolades about integrity, his teaching ability, or certainly lack of being influenced by the people in which he was uh, around and all, they were going to ask him that question. And they didn't want Jesus just to give a casual opinion like you're at a party that you were at where people just kind of casually give you their thoughts about different things. No, for Jesus, he was being addressed as a teacher. And so in that context, when he would respond there, well, they wanted a declarative voice a declarative opinion that was authoritative that they would need to respond to. It, was, it wasn't just a throwaway comment. It carried weight, it carried substance, and it was going to change things. And so they were setting him up, not only by having those uh, disciples of the Pharisees, but not only having the Herodians, but also the way in which they even formulated the question and the setup for Jesus. They were covering their bases. So, Jesus, is it right to pay the imperial tax to Caesar or not? Now, I don't know if you are a progressive tax fan, a flat tax fan, a regressive tax fan, or simply just take the approach that any tax is a bad tax and you should just never be a fan of any tax. But during that day, their taxes particularly uh, were anywhere between 45 to 50 percent of their resources. That's a lot of tax. And for uh, communities and all that were didn't have a lot of means, that were always trying to scrape things together and buy, they didn't have anything to give. But then that also was, then there was additional tax too, and there was uh, temple tax and other things, tithes and offerings. And those taxes were imposed and it was oppressive and it just consumed them and they were always trying to get out from underneath of it. No wonder they were so excited for this Jesus to show up to finally to overthrow this oppressiveness, this uh, governmental influence that was really just trying to get the best of them. And so they had all these taxes, all these taxes that were really, really getting the best of them. And now Jesus is asked, what should someone do regarding this imperial tax? Now keep in mind, the disciples of the Pharisees are simply waiting for Jesus to say, it's okay to pay the tax to Caesar. Because if Jesus ends up saying that, they can say to the people, see, he, he's not loyal to God. He thinks we should give to this foreign occupier, this idolatrous group of people. No way, you should not be given that. So they're just waiting for Jesus to go down that route. For no good Jew would think that that would be something that you would give to because it demonstrates that you're a supporter of this corrupt, idolatrous system. Um, or then there's the Herodians. Those who represented those in power of the day. And if Jesus said, no, don't take that tax, they would immediately pounce on him like a grizzly bear in the national parks. I just had to throw that in right there. Pounce on him like a grizzly bear in the national parks. 
and just waiting to attack and waiting to declare that there was a different loyalty than to Caesar, a different loyalty than to the powers there. And therefore, he would be, over, he would be taken out and the Herodians were ready. So it didn't matter if it was the religious leaders and how they were going to answer. The Herodians, Jesus was stuck. He was right there. So what do you do? What would you do if you are asked a question that no matter how you answer, you don't, you're going to get in trouble no matter what you say? It's like kind of when you get asked that question of, well, when are you going to get rid of that awful coach? Huh? <laughs> or why are you going to stop treating your pets so badly? Wait, what? It is a type of question that is loaded. Jesus didn't have a chance. Now, what does Jesus do? Well, Jesus does what only Jesus can do. He sets them up before asking them a question and before they know it. And they've revealed what is actually already going inside of them as they so innocently ask this question of Jesus. So what does he do? Well, he tells them that they're hypocrites. And then he gives them a chance to demonstrate their hypocrisy. He says to them, Oh, do you have a coin, by the way? And they respond and give him a coin, verifying the fact that they are using the very system that is idolatrous, that is not showing loyalty to God and God alone, but actually they are bought into this system in which they find themselves living. So Jesus says, as he takes that coin, whose image is this? And whose inscription is this? And of course, they say Caesar because, because the visual cue there is on that coin. And they give back to Caesar what is Caesar. And that's how Jesus responds. He says, so give back to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's. And this answer, as the text tells us there in Matthew, it was amazing and it even left them speechless. And they went away shaking their heads, as one paraphrase said it. Jesus walks this line. Not giving in to either side, but putting the context and the relationships of Caesar in the context of God's world, in the powers of the world, in the context of God's power and God's rule. That we are to acknowledge the simple fact that, as Paul put it, our ultimate citizenship is in heaven. And that we are charged to be ambassadors, to be empowered as ministers and, and join the ministry of reconciliation. The reconciliation and bearing good witness to this reconciliation we found ourselves between us and God through Jesus Christ, between one another and what Jesus Christ has done, and even the creation itself, that there's reconciliation there. There's possibilities for wholeness there too. So that in the correct context, Jesus gives us a model for how we too are to walk this line as well as citizens of heaven. That this citizenship has loyalties that are greater than present loyalties. But there's an ultimate loyalty to God and God alone in Jesus Christ. And so this leads us back to this kind of fundamental question that all Christians around the world continually have to ask. To what degree do I find myself or how much of myself do I give to my country? And how does that look? What does that look like? What does this mean on a practical level for you, for me? How do we find ourselves able to answer this question of Jesus, to give to Caesar what is Caesar's, give to God what is God's? What might God be up to in our world today as we are asked to be involved in the ordering, the structuring, the putting together the society in which we find ourselves in? That We recognize that we are part of a society and a structure that is flawed in many ways. But yet we are asked to bear a good witness and to participate in that, to structure it and try to be a part of the folks that are trying to structure it in a better way, a healthier way, a more humbling way. I have a couple of thoughts in regards to what we should do. And the first is simply this. I believe it goes without saying that we can pray. We can pray for those who are in office, individuals in office, 
Prayer is a mystery in some ways, but as Christians, we need to lift up those who are dealing with this burden of leadership. And it doesn't matter if the leader is part of our political party that we tend to affiliate with or not, but we need to pray for them, asking God for wisdom and guidance to to help lead them, to humble them, and then trust in God's providential care over them. My experience working in the, with the Department of Interior in my previous role in the national parks is there were some amazing individuals who took very, very seriously the stewarding of uh, the wilderness and the outdoors. Many Christians, in fact, who really lived into this biblical mandate of, of stewarding God's creation. Just some amazing individuals. And so for me, when I think about folks that are serving in those roles and those agencies and those kind of things, I think of Steve, I think of Kevin, I think of John, I think of Stacy, I think of individuals, Christians who are serving there. We need to pray for them, lift them up. On a practical level, too, we need to acknowledge that we need to be involved to some degree with the political process. At a minimum, we need to vote. I'm always amazed when I hear people say, oh, it doesn't make a difference. It doesn't matter. I, I'm not going to be involved. I'm not going to vote. I was like, I don't know how you can say that. I mean, it's impossible to say that. as a Christian, we are involved with the process. We're engaged in the process. We have influence over that process. It's easy to get cynical, to get tapped out, tuned out. But I don't see that as a model in Scripture. We need to be engaged and involved for it matters how our government is structured. It matters the fact as one person in our congregation was involved in the search process for uh, some of the police officers in regards to the Northbrook community, that they had an influence over that process. It matters how the fire departments are set up. It matters how the city government, it matters how the school system is set up because that's the way in which in many ways that kids are taught, worldviews are shaped. It matters. It matters. And so we should be fully engaged in those processes. Now, how you're engaged, I trust that's between you and God and the community, Christian community you're a part of to help you kind of think and discern through that. But that you're involved is what's so important. that We all need to be involved in that process. The other piece is kind of subtle. Jesus said something here that I don't want us to miss. He said, I believe, he said, whose image in this? And he took out that coin. And they responded, Caesar's. And I think in some ways, in that moment, he's putting that role in the right place. One of the most fundamental truths that comes out of the Christian faith comes from Genesis 1, 26, 27, where it tells us, so God created humans in his image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. One of the ways in which we need to look at one another is that you are created in the image of God. I'm created in the image of God. And Jesus, I think, in many ways was also saying Caesar is created in the image of God. So what are the implications for that if that's the case? I think in many ways you can have folks that you quite frankly, despise, hate, think are evil. But you can never not say they weren't created in the image of God. There is an equalizing effect there, a humbling effect in all our approach and how we get engaged in the way in which society is ordered that when we think of everyone is created in the image of God that puts us on an equal level. No matter how fallen or how unredeemed that individual is, but there is a universality of that, and that should humble us as we approach this. Caesar represented everything that was wrong with the occupiers, the brutal system that created a burden of taxes, the oppressive government. He, too, was created in the image of God. And when we are act upon our citizenship, get involved in the process of structuring and ordering society, we're going to have to deal with people, quite frankly, that who don't represent our values or the way in which we think things should be structured. We might very well be in the minority of some of that, but yet we need to bear witness to and be uh, constantly thinking about creating a system that's for the common good 
that is out there in a humbling way. We need to approach our involvement in a complete and total way. We need to be involved, be part of the process rather than disengage and think that everything is going to turn out fine. A lot is at stake if we sit on the sidelines. But as you know, the excitement and action is when you play the game. You get in the game. So if we don't pray, if we don't get involved in our local, state, national politics, I get it. It is much easier to step aside, to turn away, to just tune it all out. But as a Christian, I don't see how that's possible, biblically speaking. You know, I think it's important to know that there are Christians in other countries that would, um, they don't have the luxury of being able to influence in the way in which we can influence or participate in the process. And we need, too need to be involved in that process for a better way forward. So where is the next step for you as you think about your involvement in the way in which we order our society, the way in which you give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God's? All right, I want you to try something. Take out a piece of cash. Now, today, I only had a $1 bill. What do you have? What do you have in your wallet, your purse? Do you have a coin? I haven't seen a coin in years. <laughs> but a lot of folks might have. You can take out your debit card if all you got is a debit card. That's fine. I know a lot of people just use that. It feels weird to take out money in church like this. <laughs> Don't worry. I'm not going to ask for a collection. I, you know, that's a, I can see it on your faces. That's right. So Jesus had them take out a coin and said, give to Caesar what is Caesar's and give to God what is God. Folks, your citizenship is anchored in Christ. My hope is that you will use it for to be joined in the reconciling ministry of God here on earth as it is in heaven. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, amen. Let us pray. Gracious Lord, we thank you, O oh God, for um, helping us to be open to your word today, to help us to uh, see our role here in the place in which you have us, to be engaged in the process, to be involved, to uh, lead humbly, to uh, try to reflect the humility of Christ in the way in which we get involved, in, in the way in which society is ordered and structured. Help us, O oh God, to do that well, to do that tenderly as, and kind as well, too, to reflect you. We come before you in Jesus' name. Amen. Will you bow your heads while I... Uh pray for us today. Lord God, we praise you for the beauty that surrounds us that speaks your name, for the sunsets and sunrises, the change of seasons, and the beauty that each season beholds. Keep us in awe of your creation, but most importantly, we praise you for those who are made in your image, our families, friends, our neighbors, and our church family. Lord, we praise you for the people you have put into our lives and for your everlasting love that shines through them. Forgive us, Father, when we take for granted what we have and for who we honor with our material possessions and time. Transform our hearts by the power of the Holy Spirit to be more like yours. And Lord God, we lift up all the transition that's going on in our staffing, in our children, in our marriages. Lord, life keeps changing, but you don't. Your faithfulness and love are forever. May we be people of grace and love as we tr all transition in some manner in life. Lord, we pray for those who are suffering emotionally, physically, or spiritually. May your spirit speak to them today through us, and we be the word of encouragement that they need to hear or see. And Lord, I pray for the school boards in Illinois, that they would be discerning on what materials they allow into the classrooms and into the minds of our children and grandchildren. I pray for our government officials that they would lead with integrity and do what is right and just for all in your eyes. And Lord, I also pray for our mission partners, Pablo and Jan. 
We pray for Pablo's health and for his family as they witness the frailty of life. May your spirit comfort them. And now, Father, hear us as we pray that prayer Jesus taught all of us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Lead us, that's as we give our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory. Amen. Well, I invite you to stand as we close. blessing together.
guys. It's great to see you this morning. And uh, today, as you know, is the blessing of the backpacks. And it's really about offering a prayer for you guys. Um, now, how many of you started school this week? A lot of you start school this week. How did it go? Good. Good? Pretty good? Asi Asi. Okay. Well, all right. Yeah. Oh, okay. A little booze here every once in a while here too. That's okay too. But you went, you were there and all. And one of the things that I do at the end of every service, I offer a blessing, a, really a kind of a charge, so to speak, uh, a blessing, so to speak. And it's one of the things I say in there is like, wherever you go, Christ is sending you. And you all are being sent to school. Like as young disciples of Jesus, you're being sent to school. And you get a chance to uh, make an impact at your school and to help others uh, experience uh, perhaps uh, being welcomed into school, to be kind in school, those kind of things. Kind of reflect who Jesus is uh, there at your school. Uh, now, we get sent uh, wherever we go. We get sent to places of work. Uh, in our homes, we get places our jobs, those kind of things. But right now, you guys are getting sent into the schools. And so we want to pray for you and bless you, bless you uh, as you uh, go to your school. And so I want to just offer a prayer for you. Uh, and, all, and then what we're going to have you do is, after I pray, um, we're going to have you sit down here with your Sunday school teachers and we're going to can we sing kind of the final thing. And all, and once you guys join in in this song, uh, as we offer it over you guys and over all of us too as a blessing, all right? So let's pray. Jesus, we thank you for being sent uh, into, our, into your world as young disciples, as followers of yours in our schools. So I just ask you to be with these kids as they uh, represent you in their schools, wherever they may be, whether it's in Northbrook or Buffalo Grove or Glenview or Deerfield or any other location, Northfield as well, that they would um, uh, be kind, that they would uh, be a blessing, Lord, to their friends and all. They would reach out to those who are lonely, that they would uh, care for them and they would be um, people of uh, blessing, Lord. Lord, we ask this, ask this, Lord, in the strong name of Jesus, who we put our life in, in faith and trust. And it's in your name we pray, Jesus. Amen. All right, guys, so follow me. Come with me, and we're going to sit right over here. You guys can sit up in the front row, right here. Let's stand together and sing this blessing over you.
time. The Lord bless you. So hear this charge, not just to you, but to all of us. So wherever you go, Christ is sending you. Wherever you are, God has put you there. Christ who dwells in you has something he wants to do through you where you are. Believe this and go in the power of the Holy Spirit. In the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen.